Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. One of the most distressing, certainly the most harrowing aspect of the war in Gaza is what is happening to children. It's got a lot of attention on Al Jazeera, it's got some attention on the BBC, but sadly, regretfully and inexplicably, it's got practically no attention in India. Today, we devote the entire show on the truth concerning the plight of the children of Gaza. Joining me from East Jerusalem is the country director for the occupied Palestinian territories for Save the Children, Jason Lee. Mr. Lee, before we start our discussion, let me ask you to confirm the pretty horrifying facts which we've picked up from the BBC and Al Jazeera, and to be honest, from some Western newspapers as well. Of the over 9,000 Palestinians killed in Gaza in the last 28 days, over 3,700 are children, that's 41%. And this means one child is being killed in Gaza every 10 minutes, or 420 are being killed and injured every single day. Presumably, this is why James Elder of UNICEF has said, Gaza has become a graveyard for thousands of children. Let me start by asking, are those harrowing facts correct? Unfortunately, yes, the situation in Gaza is deteriorating and getting worse every day. We are now at a point where one child is indeed killed every 10 minutes. Last week, it was one child every 15 minutes, but it is getting worse. And these are not just statistics. These are children, a child that has dreams and hopes like every other child. The sheer numbers of civilians being injured shows the complete lack of adherence to international law. It is critical that all sides, all sides, protect civilians. We are now at a stage where two out of three people that have been killed and injured, the civilians, is either a woman or a child. So in other words, civilians are paying a disproportionate price. It is not militants, it is not men who are dying in large numbers, it is women and children. It is children always are disproportionately impacted by any conflict. In this specific case now, two out of three of the casualties and injuries are a woman or a child. Now, one more fact that we've picked up from Save the Children, and I want to check with you whether it's correct. I believe that in the last three weeks, more children have been killed in Gaza than in all of the world's conflicts since 2019. And if that fact is correct, is it an indication of the enormity of what's happening? That is true. In the last three and a half weeks, more children have been killed in Gaza than they have been in all conflicts in 2020. This is the cumulative total yearly, uh, um, so the total number in 2020, or in 2021, or in 2022. Children are being killed at a disproportionately high rate in Gaza. And it shows, the again, the absolute lack of protection, uh, centrality of protection for civilians, especially children. There are 2.3 million people in Gaza, and half of them are children. 
Now, as a responsible journalist, I should put to you that people like President Biden have cast doubt over the death toll. Israeli politicians for sure have done so. But on the other hand, Philippe Lazzarini of UNRWA has actually said the death toll is pretty close to accurate. Now, these are death tolls put out by the Hamas Ministry of Health. From your perspective and your organization's perspective, are you happy that these are accurate death tolls? Now, these are the data that is collected by the Ministry of Health. Um, the Ministry of Health is controlled by the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah. And there are obviously the Ministry of Health officials that are working in Gaza as well. In terms of the actual validity or accuracy of the data, um, Save the Children, along with other humanitarian agencies in the UN, have looked at the consecutive or the um, consecutive data or figures that have been published in previous escalations. Unfortunately, this is not the first war that children in Gaza have gone through. In all previous escalations, we've looked at the data published by the Ministry of Health compared to the UN verified data, and they're pretty accurate. There are very small differences, but these are not statistically significant. And again, if you look at the overall numbers, they are pretty accurate. So there is no reason, at least from the past five escalations, to doubt any of the data that has been coming through from the Ministry of Health. Now that we've established the facts, let's ask what happens to those children who are critically injured? I gather from the BBC that many have 90% burns, some have stomachs that have been blown out, several have, ha have hands and limbs that are missing. Do the hospitals that are functioning, and I know that very few are functioning effectively in Gaza, actually have facilities to handle this sort of grievous injury? Or are you increasingly finding that operations are happening without anesthesia and in hospital corridors? Unfortunately, the health system, even before this escalation, was already stretched. In the current escalation, because of the lack of water, the lack of electricity, and the lack of fuel to run generators, one out of three hospitals are now non-operational because of damage or just unable to run. Two out of three primary health facilities are not operational, again, because of damage from the airstrikes or no fuel, so they can't run operations. There is insufficient medicines, medical um, the facilities have run out of commodities such as bandages. And you're absolutely right. Children cannot get the medical treatment that they need. First and foremost, there are still bombardments in Gaza. So it is not safe for civilians, even those that are injured, to go to the health facilities. Most of them are closed. Most of them don't have electricity. They don't have water. They don't have supplies. Doctors and nurses are in a terrible situation of being able to, of being forced to try and triage which patients to, to attend to in corridors, using mobile phones as light sources, and not having any medicines to treat those injured. This is, I know, a grim comment, but I certainly don't mean it as black humor. But are we getting to a position where it may be better to be killed outright? by an Israeli airstrike that rather than be seriously injured because you will not get the treatment and you will simply suffer. Neither of those are options. Every child has a right to be safe and to be protected. So it is critical that we go back to adherence to international law. And that means that all sites have to prioritize the safety and well-being of all civilians, especially children. Now, the worst strikes are happening north of Wadi Gaza, probably around Gaza City. I know that in the last two days, some seriously ill patients have been taken across the Rafah crossing into Egypt. But is it possible for those who fall seriously ill or get injured north of Wadi Gaza to be able to travel south and enter Egypt? Or, or is that not an option for them because they're so far in the north, they can't come south? Unfortunately, it is not possible for many reasons why critically ill patients, patients that are, in, that are intensive care and are reliant upon medical equipment to keep them alive. First and foremost, the routes are not safe. There's still active bombardments throughout the north and the south. The conditions on the roads, many roads have been damaged because of airstrikes. 
So it is not safe. The next thing is the sheer numbers of people. There have been over 22,000 civilians that have been injured. And remember, one out of three of them is a child. The number of patients crossing into Egypt yesterday, I believe, was 81 patients. That is a drop in the ocean. There are over 22,000 people that are critically injured that need to get across. Again, the conditions are not safe to do so. There is still active bombardment, and you cannot take patients who are on intensive care units off the medical equipment that is helping to keep them alive. One last question about patients in the north who need hospital treatment because they're critically injured. How long do hospitals, in your estimation, have backup generators? I know some have main generators that have stopped, but they're surviving on backup generators. But how long can that perilous situation continue before hospitals literally stop functioning altogether? WHO have estimated that some hospitals, again, it's very unclear because it's still an active conflict in Gaza. WHO have estimated that hospitals may have up to 48 hours of fuel left to continue operations. And there is absolutely no fuel coming in? Absolutely not. Not a single truck of fuel has come in. Now, the fuel is necessary to maintain not only the hospitals, but water supplies. There is no water left in Gaza. Civilians are resorted to drinking brackish water, drinking water from wells, saline water from wells. The spread and risk of communicable diseases, especially for young children, is on the rise. So in 48 hours, when these hospitals literally wind down and stop, the prospect that will face the patients, particularly young children in need of treatment, will be a slow, painful death. Absolutely. And there are 130 premature babies that are in incubators right now, and they're reliant on electricity, on fuel to keep them going. When that ends, those machines will stop putting the lives of those 130 premature babies at risk. Now, let's come at this point, Mr. Lee, to children who are alive and mercifully not injured. What are the conditions like for them? 1.4 million people, now this is 60% of the population of Gaza, have been displaced. They have left their homes. They're seeking shelter, refuge, wherever they can. Many of them are in schools, some of them are in hospitals, and some are staying with extended family. The conditions for the, the 700,000 people that are staying in the UN facilities in the south is dire. The, the significant overcrowding, these shelters were built for maybe one or 2,000 people. Majority of them are on average four times the capacity. There is one center that has 22,000 civilians there, and they were built, it, was how, it was built to house 2,000. Massive overcrowding, lack of food, lack of water, lack of electricity, and of course, lack of medicines or any medical treatment that is necessary for the thousands of civilians that are injured. Let me pick up, sorry, please carry on. These, the, the overcrowding puts children significantly at risk. Again, no food, no water, nowhere to sleep, no protection for children. It is critical that assistance, that life-saving assistance, goods and supplies are brought in to Gaza, but also humanitarians. I need to send more teams in. This is the only way that we can meet the need of the population to find more vulnerable children, those that are also at home. Because remember, a lot of civilians have not been able to go to the shelters. I take it you can't send more teams in, A, because of the actual physical conditions in the middle of a war in Gaza. But secondly, you would presumably also need clearance from the Israeli authorities. Both are serious obstacles to sending in more teams. The regular crossings are closed. Um, the crossings that we normally use from Israel into Gaza are closed. We have not been able to establish coordination mechanisms to send teams in from Egypt via Rafah. Let me pick up on a point you made a moment ago. A particular concern, I believe, is dehydration. James Elder of UNICEF says child deaths, particularly those of infants due to dehydration, are growing every day. I believe on top of that, as you mentioned, there's the danger of unclean water. Reuters has actually reported young children complaining about the fact that the water they have is not just dirty, it's giving them bad stomachs, it's giving them runny tummies. 
is a public health catastrophe, as the WHO has warned, something that's looming on the horizon and perhaps getting closer every single day? That is correct. The numbers, the availability of drinking water in Gaza, <clears throat> excuse me, is decreasing every day. Civilians are now down to about one liter per person per day of drinking water. And they've resorted to drinking brackish water, as I mentioned previously, saline water from artisanal wells. It is critical that water supplies, that fuel supplies are sent in to establish the operations of the desalination plants. Now, there are 2.3 million people in Gaza that need water every day. Young children are more susceptible to the impacts of dehydration um, and of illness, communicable diseases, gastrointestinal diseases when drinking brackish and dirty water. Let's broaden our discussion. We're talking of children who are not just going through terrible conditions, unimaginable conditions at the moment, but they've also lived behind an Israeli blockade from 2007, 2008. During that period, they've experienced five wars with Israel. What impact would this have had on the well-being, on their psychology, and on their outlook? For 16, 17 years, their entire life has been behind a blockade. As you mentioned, this is not the first time that children in Gaza have experienced significant escalations in war. And we cannot underscore the longer-term mental health and psychosocial impacts that this has on children. All of our research has shown increasing levels of anxiety, of depression, feelings of being alone, withdrawing from friends and families, and worst of all, a loss of hope. Children in Gaza do not have hope for a future. They do not believe that they have a future. It is critical that we, again, go back to a restoration of, of adherence to global law, global international law. These are obligations that all member states, all duty bearers have to. Now, the only way, and children are resilient, they can recover. And many of your viewers who are parents know this, but in order for children to recover, they must feel safe, they must be protected, the triggers or the stresses must be removed, and they must get the support and the treatment that they need in order to recover and rebuild their lives. Now, last year, 2022, your organization, Save the Children, released a report called Trapped. It said, and I'm quoting, 15 years of life under blockade has left four out of five children in the Gaza Strip reporting that they live with depression, with grief, with fear. What does this do to their childhood? Childhood is a time when children should be experiencing carefree happiness. Clearly, that has been denied to children in Gaza for 16, 17 years. Children in Gaza that have lived through the blockade of Gaza has, have not had childhoods unfortunately, like many other children in other parts of the world. They've been subject to cycles of violence, um, not been able to live the life of a normal child. And again, the manifestations you see are the increased levels of anxiety and depression. Children in Gaza are suffering, and not just from this escalation, but from the cumulative impacts and effects of previous escalations. It is critical, again, that we return back to the global rules-based order where the rights of all children are protected no matter who they are, where they are, or the circumstances that they're in. We do not get to pick and choose which rights to defend for which children and when it's convenient to do so. These rights apply to all children all of the time. And when we don't, you see the impacts, particularly on the longer-term mental health and psychosocial impacts of children that will carry not only the physical scars, but the emotional and mental scars from the experiences of child during childhood. Now, your report, Trap, clearly suggests that the situation for the last four years has been getting steadily and progressively worse. I'm citing facts from that report. It says emotional distress has increased from 55 to 80 percent. Children who are fearful have increased from 50 to 84 percent. Children who are grieving has risen from 55 to 78%. So not only is there a cumulative effect, 
but it is progressively getting worse and worse and worse. That is correct. Um, unfortunately, the cycles of violence continue. The ability to provide therapy and treatment to these children is decreasing every year. Gaza remains under blockade, which means that there's insufficient uh, medical and trained staff in Gaza. There's not enough supplies in the hospitals and clinics, and there's not enough counselors to actually provide the necessary treatment and support. But also the fact that we've had, again, countless cycles of escalations. There were escalations in 2021, in 2022, and again this year as well. So children are, if you like, repeatedly subject to the traumas, to the events, to the escalations and violence. I hate citing statistics, but I do so because statistics also convey a sense of the enormity and gravity of the problem. And there's one that really distressed me when I found it in your report, Trap. Apparently, more than half of Gaza children have contemplated suicide and three out of five are self-harming. And this is of a period before October 7th. God alone knows how much worse those statistics would be after October 7th. What impact does this therefore have on them when they grow up, when they become young adults, when they become mature adults? Clearly, their future is benighted by what they're going through as children. Absolutely. And I just want to clarify, our report talked to a section or subsection of children. Now, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to speak to every child in Gaza, but irrespective from the sample size, from the children that we spoke to throughout Gaza, the, the findings are startling. It shows, again, the impact that prolonged exposure, prolonged um, living in uh, prolonged um, exposure to violence, uh, again, has on children. It is critical that the violence must stop. It is important that there is a ceasefire for now to stop this current escalation. But more so, it is critical that there must be a peaceful, a durable, and a just solution for the long term in order to remove these triggers, in order to restore some sense of hope, equity, and justice for all children in the region so that they can live full, fulfilling lives. Now, again, children are resilient and they can recover. They can lead normal lives, but... They must be safe, they must be protected, and there must be a stop and an end to the cycles of violence that they experience. So if then, sorry, please carry on my apologies. Only then can you have children that grow up into adults, productive members of society, but these conditions need to happen and they need the therapy, support and treatment to help them recover. So if I understand you correctly, Mr. Lee, you're saying because children are resilient, if there is an early ceasefire and this trauma stops, they can, with proper medical counselling, recover from the trauma they've been through. There is no guaranteed necessity that the trauma will lead to impairment for the rest of their lives. Absolutely. And we see this around the world as well. Children, adults, we, are, we can recover. But in order to recover, the conditions must be right. We must all feel safe and protected. This triggers the act of conflict, experiencing, hearing, and seeing what's happening around you has to stop. And then with the therapy, with the support, with the treatment, children can recover. Two last questions, Mr. Lee. The plight of the children of Gaza, as you explained, is harrowing. Clearly, it is amongst the worst aspects of what is happening in Gaza. But is the world listening? Or have people made themselves deliberately deaf and blind? Or is it that they're listening, but they're helpless? Which of the three do you think is the main response from the outside world? It's difficult for me to know what everyone in the rest of the world is thinking, even your own, your own viewers. What I would ask is that if you believe that every child in the world has a right to be safe, to be protected, to learn, to play, and to live a life um, to the full potential. If you believe that, then we must fight and protect the rights of all children, no matter who they are or where they are. It is critical. This, these are the foundations, the basics 
of international humanitarian law. These are the basis of the UN Charter on the Convention of the Rights of the Child, which clearly stipulates that all children everywhere in the world at all times have all rights that are protected. It is critical that the international community, we support and we push for a ceasefire. If we do not, this will be the collective failure of the international community to not protect and uphold the rights of all children. Aren't we very close to that collective failure happening? Unfortunately, every day it is getting worse. As I mentioned last week, the horrific statistic of one child being killed every 15 minutes. This week, it is one child being killed every 10 minutes. I hate to imagine what that figure would be next week if we do not take action. My last question, Mr. Lee, how are your own colleagues from Save the Children coping? They too are living through hell in Gaza. Yes, my own team members, like the 2.3 million people in Gaza, are experiencing the conflict now. And like the 1.4 million people that have fled their homes, all of my teams in Gaza have had to flee their homes as well. Some of them are living with extended family. Some are living in the shelters. And they're all every day wondering if they're going to be safe, desperately trying to find food and water to feed their families. My own teams are impacted, yet we are still delivering. We are still looking at distributing food, water, hygiene kits. My teams are still doing assessments wherever they can. They are doing assessments in the very shelters that they're taking refuge in. It is critical that we allow goods to come in, that we have conditions, a ceasefire, that, that means that there's no longer airstrikes and shelling, so that my team can go out to find vulnerable children. We can do assessments, we can deliver assistance, but it's critical that the goods come in and that more people come in as well. The scale and the scope of what's happening in Gaza right now is unprecedented and requires the collective efforts of everyone, of more people coming in, of more goods coming in, and also the conditions being safe for the civilians and also for humanitarians to deliver assistance. Mr. Lee, thank you very much for making time for us. And thank you very much for opening the eyes of my countrymen to a truly harrowing situation. It is so terrible that there will be some in the audience who will say it might have been better to stay blind. This is one instance where the truth is intolerable. Thank you very much for speaking to me. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.